Konami, why do these cards even exist? Let's play a game of Never Would I Ever. Never would I ever say that Konami doesn't know how to handle this game. However, I will strongly imply that that is the case. Poking fun at the bad effect monsters from the early sets of the game isn't brave or new revelation. All things considered, it's low hanging fruit in a prime position to be slapped around. But that's exactly what I want to talk about today. There were two sets in the early years of the game those being Metal Raiders and Pharaonic Guardian that introduced a weird series of nine low-level effect monsters with no relation to each other, aside from all of them sharing the effect which allowed them to attack directly. Metal Raiders, which now that I think about it, is probably the set I've talked about the most on this channel, contains six of itty bitty direct attackers. Aside from the cards that we'll be talking about and the astonishing uselessness of cards like Tainted Wisdom and Yedo Karu, this set also introduced certified hood classics like Sangan, Witch of the Black Forest, and Cannon Soldier, as well as some seriously heavy hitters like Dark Elf and Jirai Gumo. But we're here to talk about the bad cards. Jinzo number 7, a level 2 dark machine with 500 attack and 400 defense. Le Ghoul, a level 1 earth insect with 300 attack and 350 defense. Mystic Lamp, a level 1 dark spellcaster with 400 attack and 300 defense. Uguchi, gross, a level 1 water aqua with 300 attack and 250 defense. Queen's Double, a level 1 earth warrior with 350 attack and 300 defense. And Rainbow Flower, a level 2 earth plant with 400 attack and 500 defense. Pharaonic Guardian didn't have anywhere near the same critical acclaim as Metal Raiders. Granted, the set introduced the Gravekeeper archetype and a solid lockdown card for the time in King Tiger Wangu, but the bulk of powerful cards came from the spells and traps. Pharaonic Guardian contained the remaining three of the monster series in our discussion. Nightmare Horse, a level 2 dark zombie with 500 attack and 400 defense. Servant of Catabolism, a level 3 light aqua with 700 attack and 500 defense, which is one of the only 7 in the entire game, and it's easily the worst. Mucus Yoke, a level 3 dark aqua with 0 attack and 100 defense, which has an additional effect that increases its attack by 1000 during your next standby phase if it successfully inflicts damage to your opponent. And this is one of only 10 in the entire game for this attribute and type pairing. And somehow, it's even worse than Servant of Catabolism. Okay, I can fully recognize that these cards were probably never meant to be played together in a dedicated strategy. During this time, level 3 and lower monsters had an abundance of generic support that would have fit quite nicely with this collection of monsters. However, that specific support is designed solely for the benefit of normal monsters. The few cards that do aid in synergizing these cards with each other have far better uses than trying to make itty bitty OTK a thing. But what are we working with? Well, starting with Serpentine Princess, which allows you to tutor one of these monsters if she's returned from the field to your deck. So, the most inconceivable way possible. Cyber Jar and Morphing Jar number 2 allow for mass swarming, but Morphing Jar number 2 puts your monsters in exactly the position that they do not want to be in. And finally, Marauding Captain, which is never a bad choice, allows you to bring your younger sibling to the party because your mother said so. Yeah, that's all awful. Like I said, these cards have far better uses than making it easier to poke your opponent for 700 points. It's almost as though we forgot that burn cards exist. On an individual basis, this collection of monsters has some decent support by virtue of type-specific utilities. Legul, being an insect, has two means of tutoring with Howling Insect and Pinch Hopper, as well as a semi-serviceable protection with the monster Prickle Fairy. Nightmare Horse, being a zombie, has access to the recovery and swarming options of the zombie typing with Book of Life and Call of the Mummy. You also have access to the fusion monster Reaper on the Nightmare which requires you to run Spirit Reaper. And I'd highly recommend running it because it outclasses every card here. Queen's Double being a warrior has access to the array of generic warrior support cards which several also encompass spellcasters so Mystic Lamp can also be included for the most part. The best example for warrior support is obviously Reinforcement of the Army. And searching a queen's double off of Rhoda should be grounds for jail time. Rainbow Flower, being a plant, has access to quite possibly the worst line of support. 
With inconsistent recovery from Lord Poison, which requires far too much setup that this group of cards couldn't perform even if you stacked the deck, you also have some stellar stat boosting with the level 6 Fairy King Truesdale if you somehow manage to find a tribute that isn't Rainbow Flower. Oguchi, Mucus Yoke, and Servant of Catabolism, all being Aqua, have absolutely nothing in the realm of support aside from the type-specific equip and field spells and really aren't worth mentioning. I'm sure it surprises no one who's played the game for more than a single duel, but Jinzo number 7 has by far the most potent support as an individual monster. Being machine, you have the access to effortless swarming by means of machine duplication, as well as easy attack boosting with a spell card, Limiter Removal. It's nowhere near enough to put you into OTK range, but it washes everything else we've discussed as potential support. So, some of these are decent, and some of these are laughable at best. I could not pick out a specific deck that would ever consider running any of these monsters outside of the exact starter deck that I played in the Eternal Duelist Soul Game Boy game. Even during their era of the game, because trying to come up with an argument for these cards being viable in today's format will put me in a straitjacket, I can't even begin to formulate how you would or could design a deck around these cards. But here's my best approximation. <laughs> As you can see, we've removed damn near all of them, so the best use of these cards is to not play them. But, that's gonna wrap up today's discussion, guys. Let me know your thoughts. Do you have any other series of cards that you just question their existence and why they were brought into the game? Let me know. Drop your comments down below. And if you liked the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV, signing off.